and secret getting started part. The aim of the, this section is uh, to make you familiar with the, the boot chain of the STM3026, which are also very peculiar about uh, this device that you know at the end it's a flash desk device. So first we're going to discuss about boot ROM schemes, and uh, this is crucial for understanding how the N6 uh, manages its uh, boot processes. And then we're going to go through a more technical example where first you're going to understand how to get started with the discovery kit and which are uh, the various modes in which you can uh, uh, put your uh, discovery kit uh, to be able to uh, at the end of flash your application considering that the first thing that is going to start after the reset is the boot ROM. And in addition to that, we have put at the, uh, we have put some uh, interesting uh, and important uh, debugging tips, tips that will leave you as a reminder when you're going to start debugging your uh, real application. So uh, let's get started. So the N6 uh, has for sure many differences versus the STM42. Some of them you, are, you have already catched from Bartosz. Some others are in fact uh, related to its boot chain and its uh, internal structure. So it has no flash, but it has a huge 4.2 megabytes uh, contiguous RAM. And the first thing that is executed at its start is the boot ROM. First thing, and that's very important to keep in mind, by default, the Cortex M55 is in secure mode. So what the boot ROM is going to launch, which is a, a first stage bootloader, is always in secure mode. And this, of course, should be kept in mind. We are going to say it also later on, but let me underline that it can be transparent to you. So if you don't want isolation, you can work completely in the secure world. So with no big differences versus a fully non-secure application. While if you want isolation, you can enable a secure, non-secure and the non-secure callable between the two worlds. We say that it's a flashless device. So of course, uh, it has uh, very fast memory interfaces in which you can decide to put your application. So we have XSPY up to 800 megahertz, OctoSPY up to 400 megahertz, and even if FMC. Very important to note, the N6 has a, a ROM code in boot ROM. That is the first thing that is going to start after the reset. And I can already anticipate it has no option bytes. So the way to extract the boot ROM on what to do is by setting OTPs. I will be more specific about this in a few slides. First, let me mention to you the uh, boot flow components. So here there is some nomenclature we, we must uh, master before moving uh, forward. So first thing is our zero stage bootloader. Uh, so it's something uh, that is uh, you cannot change. It's, it's ROMed inside the uh, boot ROM memory. And this is what is going to start at the reset. And then what the boot ROM is going to launch is something on which you have the control and something that is written at application level with his uh, first stage bootloader. What the first stage bootloader normally is doing is basically optimizing the platform configuration and launching the application. Also here, I will be more specific about what are the main use cases of the first stage bootloader. But normally, the final aim of first stage bootloader is anyway to launch the final application. And because we have no, no volatile memory inside the device, normally these two elements, so FSBL, first stage bootloader, and application are stored in an external memory. So now we take as a subject the boot ROM, and we are going to see some uh, boot ROM schemes. So what are the logics behind the boot ROM? So the boot ROM has different modes in which it can operate. There is a very important one you must know and that we are going to try today in the hands-on that is called a developer uh, boot scenario. So here, if at the reset uh, boot one team is set to high, you enter it in dev boot mode, which means that the debug interface is uh, open and basically the code that you're going to run will be executed in the internal RAM. So the advantage is 
it's very easy to quickly test an application because you're going to rely on internal RAM. What is instead the, the cons of it is that, of course, you're going to write in a volatile memory, so it will the code will not survive a reset, but that's typically the first step of every developer. Uh, so to try in a quick and dirty manner its code running in, uh, in RAM using this developer boot mode. Then there is something that I'm sure it's more uh, will be more clear to you because uh, I guess many of you are already familiar with STM32. With a combination of boot 1 to 0 and boot 0 to 1, we can enter in serial boot. In this device, we support USB and uh, OTG and uh, UART bootloader. So here we are, we access the system bootloader, and you know that uh, system bootloader can also be used to write an external memory. So at your uh, production, you can completely rely on a system bootloader if you want. On the discovery, you are pretty lucky because the UART that is come of the ST link is also a uh, it's user two, which is an interface for the serial bootloader. And here instead, there is something very specific. So as the final portion of the scheme, we have boot from flash. In this mode, the boot ROM loads the first stage bootloader from an external flash. And it means that the boot ROM, if the OTPs are configured in a specific manner, knows that it needs to look for the FSBL and application code into an external flash. And the external flash can be selected upon this uh, list. So it can be serial or hyperflash, EMMC, or SD card. How to select one of those via OTP. So we have dev boot, so the bug open. Serial boot, which is usage of the system bootloader, so scan of the system bootloader on a user to USB interface waiting for the packet to activate the bootloader and load from external flash the application and the external memory, sorry. And you can decide the external memory based on OTP configuration. Important to know, default config is XSPY or XSPY2. Uh, so on the discovery kit, because we don't want uh, initially the user to touch any OTP, even if you could, but uh, by default, uh, the uh, external uh, OctoSpy Octo memory is mapped on XSPY2. So you don't need any OTP configuration to achieve a load from external flash, which at the end is the use case of your final application in which you want the code to be persistent across a power on reset or even a simple uh, hardware reset. So now how to enable those in real life once you have the, the discovery kit in your hands. So this is the discovery kit. In that mode, boot zero and boot one switches should be on the right hand side. Uh, what is going to happen is that in this uh, mode, using your preferred IDE, you can load the, the application in an embedded RAM, which is Axi SRAM 2, okay, uh, which has a size of 511 k bytes. If your code is bigger than 511 k bytes, you can debug the application in external flash using executing place configuration. Why this is possible? Because remember, in that mode, the debug link is kept open. You can also access the serial bootloader. This is the combi combination of, uh, of pins, so boot zero high and boot one low. You can access from uh, those two physical interfaces. One is uh, USB to UART uh, via ST link, uh, so this connector here, or USB DFU. And here we have boot from flash. So depending on OTP configuration, you can um, jump to an external flash to execute the code. And we will see there are uh, different strategies, but normally what happens in this mode is that uh, the boot ROM will look for the first stage bootloader and we copy it in XRAM2. And then uh, depending uh, on the strategy, can execute in place or copy the code in RAM. But uh, I don't want to anticipate. We're going to explain it later on. Very important in this mode, so boot from external flash, the firmware that you store needs to be recognized by the boot ROM. So it needs to have a header with at least a magic number, header, and image length and entry point. And remember, in this mode, the bug interface is normally deactivated. Later on in the debugging tips, I'm going to explain how to reactivate it. The first stage bootloader should be compiled and linked to a fixed defined address. The maximum side is the side of XCS RAM 2. It's 512k bytes. Remember, a header is mandatory. 
and optionally it can contain a signature. And the main purpose is to configure the external memory interface. And then it can work with two different strategies. It can load the application to an internal RAM and then jump to the code or configure the external memory in memory mapped mode and then jump. So in most of the cube examples that we are going to see in our deliverables, like for example, UART example, the FSBL is mixed with the application because normally those are simple application, but normally you should have an FSBL smaller than 512 K bytes and then your own application. Let's go through the FSBL project uh, just as an example, okay, to see how the execution process is behaving. At the reset, the bootroom starts. It uh, checks the header of the FSBL and if the header is there, uh, from external flash, the FSBL is copied in Axi SRAM2, and then you jump to FSBL and you can execute the application. So this is the simplest uh, view, a simplified view, I would say, uh, because uh, in, in, in reality, your FSBL should be launching in a real application. So normally what happens in what is called load and RAM configuration, I read the header of the FSBL, I copied in Axis RAM2, and then I jump to FSBL, and the FSBL is the one copying the application from external flash into internal RAM. This way to proceed is called load and RAM. The second way is called execution in place. So we read the header of the FSBL, we copy in XCS RAM2, and then the FSBL normally jumps into the external flash to execute the application. So this is more classical. So remember, trust zone is always enabled. So if you want to use isolation, you can do. If you don't want to do any kind of isolation, basically you can, uh, you can work uh, in a transparent manner in a pure secure application. In our Cube and 6 firmware implementation, we have, of course, a template examples for everything that I described to you. So we have FSBL, load and run, FXBL, ex execution in place. So load and run and execution in place are the two modes I described to you a few seconds ago. And those examples are present here with or without isolation. And then we have a template example, which is a basic load and run, where, as we say, that if the application is very small, you can have basically a single source code called the fsbl.c where both the fsbl and your application are, are inside. And this is the case of 90% of our application examples inside Q firmware and six.